The Church of England is drumming up money for a £1 billion fund to address the legacy of slavery. Is it the Church of England's job to expend their energy and precious donations to atone for it? Well, the leaders of the Church of England think it is their job, and they're setting up a billion-dollar fund to give money to black people because some of the church's wealth came from the slave trade hundreds of years ago. Now, recipients won't necessarily be descendants of slaves. They just have to be people of African descent. And some think that, given the history, this is only fair, while others believe it's just another sign that the Church of England has lost its way. The Church of England does have plenty of money about $10 billion accumulated over centuries. That endowment is invested and earns about a billion dollars in income every year. That's about a 10% return and roughly matches the church's annual running cost of a billion dollars to pay salaries and so on. The church also receives about $400 million a year from its congregation, who are overwhelmingly white English people. They give on average $20 a week. Generous when you consider everything they have to buy is getting more expensive. And now their church, founded by St. Augustine one and a half thousand years ago, this church which split from Rome 500 years ago under King Henry VIII, and which has ever since been headed by the British monarch, and yes, that means this man now, is to create a billion dollar fund to give exclusively to black people. It's enough to drive some of them mad. We don't believe in ancestral guilt. Um, we believe in putting things right in this generation between people who've fallen out. We, there, there is nothing else in which we hold our ancestors accountable for. However, Church of England leaders, including the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, and his colleague, the Bishop of York, say they feel very, very guilty indeed. We continue to live with the knowledge that our church colluded with, encouraged, and profited from human enslavement. All this self-flagellation began when the church started looking into its past and discovered that some of its wealth derives from a fund called Queen Anne's Bounty, established in 1704 to boost the incomes of poor clergy. The bounty invested in the South Sea Company, which transported 34,000 slaves from Africa to the Spanish Americas during the 1700s. This was a company given a monopoly by the British state to take slaves from the west coast of Africa. Last year, almost every single bishop voted to set up a fund worth $125 million, equal to 1% of the church's endowment. But $125 million wasn't enough for some. I don't think $100 million, I think that's a drop in the ocean in comparison to what the church gained from its involvement and complicity in the transatlantic slave trade. The church appointed what they call a black-led independent oversight committee, chaired by the Bishop of Croydon, which demanded ten times more, well over a billion dollars. Here's one of her colleagues. We realise that the £100 million, pounds, even though it was a good start, it's not enough. Because if you look at the money generated that the Church of England made over those years, during the period of, of enslavement, it runs into billions. The Oversight Committee recommends Church of England money be dispersed to black charities, businesses and individuals in the UK, Caribbean, Africa, Latin America and North America. And that this redistribution of wealth is justified because black people are worse off than their white counterparts. The importance isn't the figure, it's the acknowledgement. It's the finally acknowledging, yes, we were culpable, yes, we were complicit. The argument against this new fund can be listed thus. Britain abolished slavery 217 years ago in 1807. Is it really fair for someone to claim money today for what happened to their great, 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 great grandfather? Especially when statistics show that today, in modern Britain, black pupils are achieving as well, if not better, than their white English peers in school. And that black people are to be found in the highest offices in the land, including Chancellor of the Exchequer, Foreign Secretary, and the current Secretary of State for Business, Kemi Badnock. Britain is uh, the best place in the world to be black. Other critics of the fund point out that all the talk about slavery focuses on the transatlantic, but never on the Barbary slave trade, in which Europeans, including from England and Ireland, were enslaved by traders from what is now Tunisia, Libya and Algeria. Others argue the money would be much better spent on the millions of slaves who are alive today, suffering in places like Mauritania. 
on the west coast of Africa, this was the last country to officially end slavery in 1981. Let's talk about what's happening today. There is slavery happening today. And there are people in Africa who are being enslaved today. What are they doing about that? Nothing. Well, let's bring in our guests now. And today we have two members of the Anglican clergy with rather different opinions. Reverend Yemi Adeji, originally from Nigeria and now residing in Cambridgeshire, and Reverend Dr. Ian Paul, who is a member of the General Synod of the Church of England. We also have the historian and author Rafe Hadel Manku. Welcome to all three of you. Uh, Yemi, if I may start with you. Of everyone on this panel, you're the one who supports this fund the most. Why? Because it helps to... It, no amount of money or funding can help in the um, in, in helping the uh, my generations who have been dehumanized because of the slavery. But I very much support this fund because it will create the opportunity for the downstreams, particularly in the area of education, because the outcome of slavery itself is racism. And so it will go a long way in helping the generations coming behind me for education, understanding of what this will mean uh, if they learn about it. And then we can begin to see each other uh, created equally by God. So there's no amount of funding that can help the dehumanization of um, that slavery have caused all over the world. So I very much support this uh, as a means of helping all the uh, all, all the bad deeds that have been done over you, the years. You say there's no amount of money, but of course there was an argument about the amount of money. Originally it was proposed to be 1% of the endowment, around 100 million uh, pounds or 120 million uh, dollars. Then it was said by the Independent Oversight Committee, which was black-led, that it ought to be 10 times that amount. Um, are you satisfied with a billion? Should it be more? I think you always start from somewhere. But what I'm saying is it could be an investment that more money could be put in the pot for future. So we can't put real money value on the dangers, on, on, the, on, the, bad, on the effect this has on people over the years, and even for us who are still living now. But we can change the future. That's why the investment of this to re-educate and to help the downstream will help a lot for the future. Uh, Reverend Dr. Ian Paul, no amount of money can make up for the historical sins of the Church of England. Uh, no, that's a really interesting question. And the, the, one of the issues is, uh, are we in the business of atoning the sins for previous generations? Uh, I'm half Irish. My mother came over from Dublin after the war and she faced signs saying no blacks, no Irish, no dogs. And of course, the Irish were treated terribly by British colonialism. Millions died in the potato famine. Uh, and and uh, many, many Irish were enslaved as well. So if we're going to rep do reparations for uh, other parts of slavery, should we do it for this? I think the real problem is this report, which isn't really a, a Church of England report. It's come from a group referring to another group. And there's no, been no sort of real scrutiny of this. The problem is it makes a claim that we are sitting directly on money that was made from the slave trade. And unfortunately, the historical data says that's not true. At the time when the Queen Anne's bounty was invested in the South Sea Company, the South Sea Company actually lost money in their slave trading. Uh, that's not to say that it's not abhorrent. It's not to say that the, that the Church of England at the time failed to challenge this, this wicked trade, but they actually got the money from government bonds. But there's a, a two other bits of, of information we need to take really seriously. One is, um, is there a direct connection between inequality between different ethnic groups today and the past of slavery. I think that's very, very hard to argue, given that from government data, those who do best, for instance, in the education system, number one are Chinese, number two are Asian, number three are black Africans. And at the bottom of that list comes black Caribbeans and white working class British. So uh, we, we need to take seriously what the data okay. says about inequality. A, a lot I think of... the third thing is, are we, are we concerned about combating inequality? And the answer is, we certainly are. We certainly are interested in pursuing justice. Oh. And I've got no objection to that at uh, all. A lot, of different, a lot of different points raised there in that answer from Ian. Rafe, just take the historical point, first of all, that the, the whole thing was based on flawed research. That's right. I mean, it says directly in the um, in the report that slavery was uh, was the, the the issue was the industry that actually fueled Britain's growth in the 17th and 18th centuries, and that's patently absurd. I mean, in 1770, slavery accounted for. I mean, the sugar industry, which was based on slavery, accounted for three percent 
of uh, capital formation in Britain. That is some equivalent to what was being spent on uh, beer, hops and barley. And nobody has ever suggested that the beer industry fueled uh, Britain's economic growth during that period. In fact, of course, Britain has more than paid its debts in terms of slavery by becoming the first nation in history to spend money against its own national interest. I'm speaking about the vast resources that were spent with the West Africa Squadron in enforcing an end to the Atlantic slave trade. The amount of money spent was about 2% of GDP. That's a sum equivalent to our entire defense budget today. And that's also not including the vast amount spent later in actually freeing slaves, a debt that Britain only paid uh, recently. Uh, there's been, never been a case in history where one nation did so much to try to atone yeah. for its sin. The, okay. the, the second half of the British Empire was all about atoning, and it's thanks to the Church of England who actually uh, created the atmosphere for abolitionism that uh, we, we have the abolition of the slave trade. Were it not for the Church of England, abolition may not have happened for decades later. So the C of E should be celebrating its role in abolishing slavery rather than constantly wearing a horsehair shirt and beating itself right. up about it. Right, Yemi, I'd, I'd like to get your answer on that because the other two are saying that essentially it's a it's flawed history, and in any case, they England, the Church of England, and the rest of the other institutions have paid their debt. I think I think we have to put an woman um, woman um, aspect into this. It's not only about whether the some some parts of money have been paid. We are talking about the humanization of human beings that have led to generations that have lost their identity that um, have uh, led to racism, and that I, as a person, I'm, I'm, I'm still suffering part of that that came out of that. And then my, so are my parents and the children that are born in this country. So it's not even, that's why I, I, I keep saying, you cannot put money value, uh, what you pay back for slavery. Yes, slavery was abolished, but in reality, some of us are still enslaved today into the world of racism that we can never get out of. Now, I am black. I understand what I'm talking about. That might be very different to someone who is not from the context and the, uh, the, the, the background where I come from. But ask, stop any person of uh, black heritage, either Caribbean or African, and ask them the same question they will tell you that it cuts deep into their being, into their soul, that they see from generation up, could, up to where they are. Could I just let Rafe come in there for a second? Could, could I let Rafe come in? Yeah, I think it's deeply patronizing and offensive to treat any group of people as victims when they clearly aren't. We're talking about the great, 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 great grandchildren of slavery. And as appalling and horrendous as slavery was, and of course that's undeniable, what's also undeniable, and this is an uncomfortable truth, is that the lives of the descendants of slaves alive today in Britain are of a far higher quality and far better than if their ancestors had never, never left West Africa. In Benin and Nigeria, for example, which is where most slaves came from, the average life expectancy is 60. In Britain, for a black person, it's 85. The, uh, a quarter of a century longer, essentially. If you look at uh, disposable income, the average income in Benin is 1,300 per, per year. In Nigeria, it's 2,000. In Britain, it's £35,000, just over 20 times higher. So as horrendous as slavery was, it's impossible for me to understand in precisely what way it has disadvantaged black people today. What's disadvantaging them is constantly telling them that they are victims and that their own situation is a result of other people rather than actually situations within their own communities. Ian, before can, I bring I Femi back in, can I, can I just... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I, think, I think there's some really, some really strange things going on here. I mean, the idea that I am wounded by the treatment of my great-great-grandfather, I mean, that means I must carry the burden of, for instance, the potato famine, so why aren't I being compensated? But I think the, the problem with this whole debate is that if you read the report and you read other statements that are coming out from some groups in the Church of England, it's being cast very much in the terms of what's known as critical race theory. 
imported from America, which is part of the culture wars. And the problem there is that how I feel about myself dominates, and, it, and, and there's no rational answer to that. If I feel disadvantaged, then I am disadvantaged and I need to be compensated. And the report is full of the language of deconstructing whiteness. Now, I think that's racist language. So this report and this whole approach is actually a racist approach to anti-racism. And I think it's just, we can see from the conflict that this has had and the strong reactions on either side, this is no way at all in order to address some important issues about history okay, and let's justice. Bring, let's bring Yemi back in. I, I think my, my, my challenge here is that uh, if you, any of you, have ever experienced discrimination, prejudice, um, Rac um, I have. My mother has. Racism. My grandfather in, in has. My own, grandfather in, in took up arms against let, the let British explain, oppressor. Let me explain. Right. The way you the way you explain it as a white person is different from a person of color like myself. And I will I'm say that because too. why is that? Why why are we dividing ourselves? Let, let me by explain. Race? Let me let me explain. What I'm what I'm trying to say to you is that uh, all these are outcome of slavery, because there are some things that have uh, become parts and parcel of the way you are wired as a human being that even when you are part in diaspora in this part of the world, there's no way you are not going to experience that. And these are the outcome of slavery that you might, you have not experienced, you don't understand what it takes. And I'm saying that because these are intergenerational uh, repercussions of what slavery has caused. Where people but for me, this isn't ancient history. For me, my grandfather, who I knew, took up arms against a racist colonial are, oppressor. Right? So, so why, even why is that not affecting me the same way? Because we find ourselves in the part of the world where I, I wouldn't expect the, uh, the experience of slavery will not be a great effect for me if I live in Nigeria. But it will be different for the black Americans and those living in Caribbean because of those experiences. And it's different for me They're because I live in America. diaspora here in the West. So talking there about the are some Church of England in Britain some here. understanding that we need to take note of. It's not, it's not about economics, whether the GDP, whether the, the, the where, where people live longer in the UK than they live longer in Africa, but we are talking about the, the effect of dehumanization that still affects people till today. And that's why we're doesn't. saying that... Yemi, Yemi if, I could just, if I could just interrupt you for one second, let's pick up on that point, please, uh, Rafe. It is an important point which has been raised uh, many times. Uh, they say that it was worse than just slavery. They were actually dehumanized and that it continues today. It doesn't continue today. I mean, there is no evidence backing it up. The most disadvantaged group in Britain are actually white working class boys. Only 4% of the British population is actually black. So to, 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 to give one billion pounds, an astonishing amount of money to such a small group when there are so many other equally deserving people of all colors, of all creeds, uh, and of all races, well, is, is, it is and always will be wrong. And it seems increasingly that the Church of England is motivated not so much by doing the most good, but by virtue signaling to the current fashions. What uh, it's doing is it's gradually replacing theology with ideology. And it's the ideology of critical race theory and it's, you know, it's offspring, DEI, diversity, equity and inclusion. And it's importing, you know, essentially into this country, the culture wars of America. And there's a new religion it's instituting. It's the religion of woke with new original sin. And the new original sin is slavery. Just a point of fact, uh, the report uh, from the Oversight Committee says that the money should not go solely to black people in Britain, but also in America, the Caribbean, and other areas. Um, but there are other issues, Femi. So I don't think uh, it's going to be possible or legal, actually. Yes, we'll have to see how it plays out. But, Yemi, there, there is another issue. In fact, there are several, um, and we try to get them in before the end of the program. One is that why isn't this money being used to help people who are enslaved around the world right now, P victims of modern slavery. Um, Yemi, the, the Independent Oversight Committee was black-led and seems to be focused entirely uh, on the uh, welfare of black people, which is kind of understandable as that was their remit, but not one word uh, for the people in Mauritania or North Korea and various other countries who are enslaved today. Do you think some of that money should go to help them? I think... Um... For me, I think we should be looking at humanity as a whole, not whether we're black, white, from Mauritania, from China, or from wherever it is. Though we do know that this particular funding is meant to pay back the effect of slavery. I honestly believe that uh, if that's where they want to divert the funding to for um, transatlantic slave trade, that's fair enough. 
But I also acknowledge that there's all manners of slavery all around the world that we must take cognizance of. Now, whether part of that funding wants to be used for that or not, we, 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 I'm going to leave that for those who are making decisions. But there is enough of this that can be used, that can be invested for the future, particularly in the area of education. Because what I'm trying to say to you is that uh, the effect of slavery, which I'll keep paying emphasis upon, is the uh, the racism that is still works very very evident? There is institutional racism, whichever you want to look at it. But we must help the younger ones who are coming, the ones we are giving back today, to re-educate them, to let them come to the understanding of what this means, so that they don't repeat what we see in our world okay. today. Quick response from well, Ian, and then Rafe. Ian. Yeah, I think I think I think it's really shocking that the report made no mention of modern day slavery. Uh, currently today, Jeremy Black estimates there's 43,000 slaves in Mali today. Uh, one of the chief um, gains of the missionary movement, the, the led by the Church of England, was that, for instance, David Livingstone went and pleaded with chiefs to stop slavery. Slavery was endemic in inter-African tribal warfare, and, and it was the influence of missionaries which suppressed that. So, uh, extraordinarily, the report actually says in paragraph 32 that the Church of England should repent of disrupting African spiritual religion by bringing the gospel. The, 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 the Anglican community is majority black, and the, the report says that that was wrong. We should repent of it. I think it's absolutely shocking. Mm. Uh, Rafe, uh, essentially then, the report is asking the Church of England to apologize for spreading Christianity, its own mission, uh, in Africa. Well, the first thing to note is that this report isn't written by a group of uh, impartial authorities. That, that must be said. In fact, one, one of the members of, of this oversight group is a self-proclaimed activist, reparationist, a member of the International Campaign for Reparation. So this isn't a group of, of, uh, of academics who are neutral. And yes, the, the point's very important. What we should be saying is that the Church of England, for the first time in human history, we had the evangelical Christian movement called the Clapham sect, just a mile or so from me here in London, that created slavery was universal, but the rise of the abolitionist movement was unique to world history. And it was something that could only ever have come out of Britain and Protestant Western Europe. And we should be celebrating that and look forward rather right. than permanently creating a system of victimhood in this country. I just want to give the last answer here to, to, um, to Yemi. Because, Yemi, you have a very interesting background, you know, descended from African nobility. Um, some of your ancestors actually uh, owned and sold slaves to the Europeans. Now, that's a very complex picture, isn't it? Because there, there will be uh, black people whose ancestors did do the same thing. Should they receive uh, funds as well? I don't think so, because um, the, the whole issue of uh, slavery, compensation, and what, what not is not something we pay emphasis to uh, back where I come from in West Africa. Uh, it's, it's long gone, it's forgotten. Uh, there are other forms of evil that are existing there today. Uh, but it, it was a normal thing for a king to own slaves in, in, in those days. My great, great, great grandparents are uh, a king in one of the tribes in Nigeria, uh, have slaves, hold slaves. But the truth is they do not dehumanize their slaves because they work for them. Um, well, forgi forgive me, forgive me. Sorry, historical. forgive me, Yemi. Uh, forgive me, Yemi. No, do, do come in. If the issue has been forgotten in Nigeria, why on earth are we banging on about it here now with reparations? If, if in Nigeria they've forgotten about it, there are more important things to deal with. Surely in the Church of England there are more important injustices to deal with than what happened 250 years ago, which we repented of. But I, I just want to highlight the point that Yemi's making. He's saying that in those times in Africa, amongst kings, it was normal to own slaves and to sell slaves. And, but what they didn't do is take the additional step of dehumanizing them. Um, yeah, come in, Rafe. Yeah, I'm a, yeah, I mean, the, the, there were more slaves held in bondage in Africa than were ever transported across the continent, across the transatlantic slave trade. And actually, if you look at places like Benin and the Kingdom of Dahomey, it, they had absolutely brutal treatment of slaves. In fact, you know, they were also working on plantations there too. Not only that, every year there were annual human sacrifices of slaves 
uh, in the numbers of tens of thousands, amounting eventually to hundreds of thousands, if not millions. So the idea that they were living in some sort of unchattel type of slavery is for the birds, I'm afraid. Yemi, um, it's, I think, it's, I, think, it's, I think you are reading too much history. You are, you are trying to tell me the history of where I'm a historian. I'm telling you the fact. I, I care. I care. This is my origin. You want to interpret and educate me on my origin? I think that, that that's appalling. This is but this, this is, is, the, where this is the thing we're contending this, now. You see, this because is my this report world. is not based in historical go to, facts. Go to Ghana. It's making historical go, go claims, Ghana, but they're not based in historical facts. Go to Ghana. Go to Ghana. Go to all these places. These are the these these are the places are still there. The history are there. I I beg of you to go there and go and read the history and 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 meet. The, I wish the you would too, because the, facts are more important museum. than feelings. And let them explain this is the problem with the entire Black Lives Matter movement and the reparations debate. Not where true. emotions My are not relevant when we're discussing also, which they still have the place where they keep the slave, how they treat them, how they how they feed them, what, what they do for them. They send them on errands. In fact, some of them go away from being slaves to go back to where they come from and then become shifts in their own village. So what you are trying to say is absolutely... How can you know my history more than me? Uh, Yemi Adeji, Ian Paul, and uh, Rafe Hadel Manku, thank you all very much for your contributions to the next today. Much appreciated, and thank you at home on your phones for watching. If you want to see this episode or any of our other episodes, do go to our channel on YouTube. Just type in Nexus TRT World. Until next week, then, goodbye. <laughs>